Hey everybody, Mike Giardino with CrossFit Health. We're at the 2022 CrossFit Games, and really the person next to me doesn't need an introduction, but we're gonna do it anyways. Mr. Kelly Starrett, we're here, and we're gonna talk a little bit about movement compensation mm. prior to our panel, where we have, man, we, I think we have a really interesting uh, kind of, uh, what am I looking for, just panelists, a group of panelists. Bright minds, there are some, there's some real talent here at, I, I know it's the CrossFit Games, but we can yeah. call it CrossFit Con. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It really is, like, it, it is some of the best coaches in the world on the planet are here right now, either coaching or just here in attendance. That's amazing, and it's amazing. And we've been able to pull them in into this panel where we have, you know, an expert like yourself in terms of, well, everything, right? From, from coaching to running an affiliate to physical therapy and movement. I mean, everything that you do uh, you're at the expert level, which well, is pretty amazing. You should hear a thank you. But what I'll say <laughs> is I'm at the pointy end. I know what it means to work with people, yeah. not in an abstract way. Right. And I know what it's to look to work with injured people, people who are coming off the street, beginners. You know, that really frames how do we progress skills from sure. the kids that are at, at our gym. You know, I'm not just a dilettante. We had, you know, we ran an adaptive course tied with the University of California, San Francisco. We have a master's program. We, yeah. So how do we integrate all those things? And more importantly, what's the through narrative? Yeah. So that if I have children who are developing with me that I'm now coaching at college or into the Olympics, yeah. how do, has my coaching evolved with them or how do the movement practices yeah. stay consistent so we can continue to scale and develop and become more sophisticated? Jeez, you know, this is, this is already sparking uh, ideas for future interviews in terms of integration into you know, how to coach children and, and build them up the way you just talked about, but even the masters and adaptive side. But I don't want to go there yet. We'll do that. We'll save that for another time. What I want to talk about today um, essentially is what we're going to talk about at our panel, and that's movement compensation. Um, how, how would you define that? What are we, when yeah. we say movement compensation, I, th I think that's thrown out a lot as a term in the CrossFit community. You know, oh yeah, I'm compensating my movement because of an injury or whatever it might be. Uh, but maybe, maybe there's no, they don't really have a clear definition of what it is. So can you clarify that for us? Yeah, you know, one of the reasons we started using this word compensation is that it was, had less baggage than movement fault or okay. movement error. Okay. So it was a, hey, you're moving in this way, which is less effective, has less transference, is less economical. It's more energy inefficient. Right. And that may be because you lack the ability to achieve a certain position, right. or you just don't know, or you've fatigued and you've lost your brain because it's so hard and the, the hate in your ears is so much that you just go unconscious, which <laughs> happens, right? Totally. So what we want people to understand first and foremost is we're always looking for a, a good model for understanding the physiology. And in our world, we have what we understand to be the best expressions of the shoulder, of the hip, of mm -hmm. the spine. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're humans and we're not the first group to take a crack at going, how do we walk faster? How do we carry? How do we throw? How do we, people sure. have been doing this forever. Yeah. But we now we have a good understanding of the physiology. So what is the shoulder geometry? What is the shoulder mechanics? What, mm -hmm. are, what is the fascia and connective tissue muscular say about what is stable and more effective? Sure. But then we can overlay that on top of what is the best technique. And it turns out that if you are looking at the body, but not looking at also simultaneously how we teach Olympic lifting or mm -hmm. how the powerlifters coach or what running looks like, mm -hmm. what we see is that there's no divergence between coaching cues mm -hmm. and best function of the body. Interesting. Think about all the coaches for thousands of years trying to get more out of their warriors, more out of the, the competitors, and they figured out a long time ago that he, these cues give us better stability, give us more economy, give us more efficiency. So what that does is that potentially gives us a model where we can explain why we're coaching the way we're coaching. Yep. These are the cues you're using and, and the reasons why. It allows us to predict movement compensation okay. and moving away, hey, if you, I see if you can do this, this means when we actually apply these things towards life and sport, we have a model for prediction, especially if you can't put your arm over your head. I know what your swimming's gonna look like, yeah, right? right? It really is like, makes everyone basically naked, right? We yeah. can just strip you down. But also we have a communication model, a language where you and I can communicate from across the room, across the globe, around the same thing, because I've taught on every continent except Antarctica, 
and the push-up is the push-up, and the squat is the squat. Sure. And it's not math right. and science that's a universal language, it's training is the universal language. That's awesome, that's really cool. That opens a lot of doors for us. Um, here's another question. So when we're talking about movement compensation, and we're looking at kind of how these joints should be moving, and how that overlays into efficient technique. When you start to diverge from that, what are the risks? And I think what t people tend to think is the risk is mm. injury. Like that's our, oh, we need to stop this because that's the major risk here. Is injury the major risk or is that a little bit lower on the totem pole and there's something else that's a, a, a higher risk? In the gym, injury risk is actually, the gym is the safest environment. I really have, I've been saying this for a decade. It's the place where we can control the variables, sure. right? Yeah. And if we have clear communication of here is the best technique that's available to you in this moment based on your age and injury history and sure. movement, that may mean that you're going fast and I'm going slow, that I'm doing a pressing snatch balance yep. and you're doing a heaving snatch balance, right? right? But we're both snatch balancing, right? Sure. Yep. I'm doing a muscle snatch and you're doing a full snatch. Right. So it doesn't, on the one hand, I as a coach and as an athlete can control the variables, but all, if all I value is, did I add another kilo to the bar? then yep. we forget why we're training. And it's not just better physiology. Because I can do five more air squats in 20 seconds, doesn't mean I'm a better mover or a more efficient mover, right? right? So what we're really looking at simultaneously is, what are the parameters of you getting into the best shape and positions and efficient movement patterns that have the most transferability for you today? Yeah. That's enough. Because the body is so resilient and durable. And I think the problem is we said, don't do that, you get injured. I'm like, hold up, yeah. like that's crazy. I say don't do that because it's a dead end technique. Right. That's now going to make it more difficult for me to advance your programming. Or you're going to see that that's going to get really inefficient at mile 10. Right. Or that technique worked, but suddenly the way you're snatching isn't going to work when you want to snatch more than 60 kilos. Right. So, so, we, right, so we see that. And sometimes think, hey, the human brain is designed to solve problems and to move and come up with moving solutions. If you want to see what I'm talking about, come over to our adaptive athletics. Yeah. So suddenly we have adaptive athletes who are movement sol problem solving with joints and positions. They, they, they can't express, what you see is they're able to express stable, rad positions that generate a lot of force. Yeah. The only thing I would say is these positions sometimes are less robust and, and more less transferable and less sort of infinite in terms of their application. So the real reason that we're always trying to harp on technique mm -hmm. is that it allows us to go faster and lift more weights and prepares us to then transfer. If Look, if I do everything and my feet turned out, how am I gonna run? How am I gonna jump and land and cut? So if the goal is moving beyond just exercise for cardiovascular health, right? right? Or right. exercise for metabolic health, that's a different conversation than I'm trying to prepare you to go play tennis or be in the world or prepare for the unknown and the unknowable. Yeah, yeah, transferability. And I think we, we tend to hear quite often, you know, we see this in, let, let's pull a workout out, right? Like um, Isabel. And we tend to see- My favorite. Exactly, well, this technique works for me in Isabel, right? And it's, you know, the rounded back, I'm gonna slam it to the ground and whip the bar up overhead. Now, is that acceptable based off of that task or are we building a movement pattern that is now gonna be very inefficient later on in other... So the, notice that you and I aren't having a conversation is, is that dangerous? Right. The, the conversation is, why am I training in the first place? Right. I'm training, so what I like to think is, let me redefine CrossFit for you, yeah. right? Ready, hold on to your butt. <laughs> Constantly varied, high intensity, functional movement, right? What we're gonna do is say, here are these fundamental patterns, going from this internally rotated shape, something in my hand to overhead. Yep. That is a fundamental movement pattern. Yep. This is a shape I have to have. So what I'm really doing is saying, okay, here's a shape that I value. Now, how can I challenge that shape? Well, okay. the traditional model before CrossFit was we'll just make it heavier, and we'll yeah. just make it heavier, and then we'll add some more volume. And now suddenly with CrossFit, we're like, can you do that with your heart rate at 180? Right. Can you do that for more than five reps or three reps? Can you do that under some metabolic load? Can yep. you do that with some comp competition sure. where there's stress, stress yep. right? Can you do that if I'm coming from a new movement, right? So suddenly what we realize is that, hey, I have this fundamental pattern. I can Cuban press 
cool. You can even muscle snatch. But when I start to add speed and repetition to it and a little metabolic demand and respiratory demand, I see that your technique wasn't stable. Mm -hmm. What I was able to do was actually without heavy loads, mm -hmm. I was able to challenge your fundamental movement patterns. And what we want people to understand is not just who can get the most work done. We have plenty of workouts. Carry this sandbag from here to here. Get on the assault bike. But in these high skill things, we want people to begin to understand that when we started this, no one was very fit and very strong. Yeah. Now we have mutants coming in. Yeah. And what we want to say is, hey, do you see that, since you're not the games trying to win a million dollars, that what's happened is that rep 20, we started to see divergence in your expression of technique and power. Yeah. Right? Greg Glassman a long time ago said, hey, you can handle post-maximal loads in these safe isometric positions. It doesn't matter. You're safe. Yeah. So what we want people to begin to feel is when they start to make movement errors, mm -hmm. then we know that that's our intention. Our intention is to challenge your positions and ability that to hold this. Training we have to. Yeah. That's yeah. it. I need you to make mistakes. But if you can't walk away from the abyss and you just yeah. continue to devolve into something else, that is practice. And now you're practicing skills that you're going to re revert to when it's not gonna serve you at 185 pounds. It's not gonna yeah. serve you at 225. And the proof is in the pudding. Look at our athletes, yeah. how efficient they are. Look at yeah. how efficient Mal is. Look at how yeah. efficient Haley is. Look at how efficient T yeah. is. And as they become more fatigued, as the week goes on, their technique improves. Where we see less force leakage, we see less dumping, less movement solutions that are creative, right? Because they're not solving the problem because they can't get away with it. I was gonna say, because they have to. They have to. They have to. They're beat down, they have to conserve energy. So what we can actually think of is, believe it or not, this is the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. We see going from high entropy, yeah. right, to low entropy. So if I'm well organized, that's a low entropy, low entropy state. Sure. And it actually costs more technique and more learning and more practice to be efficient. Yeah. The body wants to devolve oh, because sure. it costs less energy to and be you there. You see it in right? running, yeah. running long distance. Exactly right. right. You start off, everything's nice. Looks and good. By the end, yeah, just I'm like, like what happened? Did you get a car during this thing? <laughs> so what we're what we're understanding here, and the reason the CrossFit Games is so important, is that it has been, it's shown us that we can. A lot of our mutants can get away with anything for yeah. six minutes or ten minutes. Right. right. For three minutes, it doesn't matter. But what we're interested in is, can you do it? time and time and time and time and sure. time again. And rem remember, what we're training for is life. Yeah. And so if we take the view out, hey, you're metabolically fit, cool, that's great. Your car yeah. respirator, you're coming up, you're getting fit, you're getting strong. Yeah. Now how do we take the next conversation, which is transferability? Sure. And that's where we say, hey, look, this thing that you're doing is less effective. And more importantly, if you're trying to muscle up, you're overhead, I need, you have to pull the rings to this, this parallel yeah. position. Yeah. You have to bring the elbow. That's how we climb ropes. But if you overhead squat like this, what do you think your pull's gonna look like? Yeah. How are you gonna climb rope? What's your yeah. handstand look like? Yeah. And what you fail yeah. to realize is that one of the genius aspects of CrossFit training is that I am practicing overhead positions in 50,000 different modalities. And so the principle about how the shoulder gets stable, how Mike Bergner says, hey, it's armpits forward, it's creating rotation, sure. right? Yep. Those positions transfer to me grabbing a barbell, grabbing a kettlebell, grabbing Even uh, overhead. something like a butterfly pull-up. I always you see people try to do it this way. In, in reality, doing a butterfly in this position is more effective. more effective. So the key is I think people were like, well, I have to be so locked down like a power thrower. I'm like, no, 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 no. You have to be stiff enough to maintain your best mechanics. Right that are available to you. And then what we also want to begin to layer on here is, as a coach, I'm like, why are you moving this way? Yeah. Well, it turns out, when I saw you reach over and pick up the dumbbell, you were rounded back. Well, I don't think you're gonna explode your back. Right. I own an affiliate. I saw thousands and <laughs> hundred thousand rounded People movements. do it every day. Yeah. And we didn't see yeah. the spines explode. Yeah. But we could ask the next question. Do you have full range of motion at your hip? Right. Because what we're suddenly realizing is that this is the best diagnostic pl program on the planet. Right you cannot hide your inefficiency. I'm gonna find it as a coach. Yeah. And I want people to come into CrossFit and say, hey, I really want to become a more efficient, more effective mover for my sport. Yeah. It's really difficult to do that in sport. It's really easy to do it as soon as I expose you to the CrossFit curriculum. It's almost the, the thought process for the coach isn't, hey, don't do that, you're gonna get injured. It's, why are you doing that? And, hey, that's less effective. Le yeah, and so let's figure it out. So let's right? get you moving, and, and remember, if we had a new person coming in, 
we don't say, we, we're like, that's good enough today. Good job. You were safe. You didn't yeah. wobble. We slowed you down. Yeah. We, had, we were able to keep intensity up. We were able to challenge you. Look at our classic on-ramp, row 500. Did people die rowing 500? No. Right? Do people die doing air squats? It's no. super simple. No, they might feel like it. But no. <laughs> they're, they're, right. Psycho-emotionally. But what we realized then is we just want to expand the conversation by saying this is as good as you can do today. And now also, part of my coaching job is not just to make you a bigger engine right. by putting another engine on, by another cylinder on the Ferrari. Right. My job is to find these issues. Hey, I see that you don't have any ankle range of motion. Yeah. I wonder if that's going to be a problem for you when you step or jump or land or play your sport. Well, we can solve that in the gym. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, this is great. I don't want to. I don't want to dig into everything we're going to talk at the, uh, talk about at the panel. So we'll stop there, and then uh, we'll really dig into this when we have everybody here at uh, one o'clock. Fantastic. The, uh, in the venue. Coaching. Look, these athletes. Who cares, really? Let's be honest. Yeah. I'm all about the coach. Yeah, the coach. You know? And that's who I hope we have in the stands there. Yeah. And we have some. We have you. We have some amazing coaches. We have another physical therapist. I mean, it, our panel is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see you guys answer these questions. The problem is, awesome it's only discussion. what six hours long. We need 12 hours of this. We building. we need a day at least. That's right, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks. Good to talk to you again.